Hello, my chai drinkers. How are you? Welcome to episode six of season three of the show, coming to you from Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Anusha Hussain. When you think about American mainstream media, the image that naturally comes to mind is that of a white, middle-aged man or woman, and with good reason. Whiteness has been synonymous with journalism and media in the U.S. since forever. From Walter Cronkite to Dan Rather to Wolf Blitzer to Diane Sawyer and Barbara Walters. But there have always been people of color, pioneers who shattered barriers from day one, like our guest today, Maria Inojosa. For over two decades, journalist Maria Inojosa helped tell America's untold stories and bring to light unsung heroes in America and around the world. In 2010, she launched the Futuro Media Group with the mission to produce multi-platform, community-based journalism that gives critical voice to the voiceless by harnessing the power of independent media to tell stories that are overlooked or underreported by traditional media. As the anchor and executive producer of the long-running weekly NPR show Latino USA, and as the anchor of the Emmy award-winning talk show Maria Inojosa One-on-One, Inojosa has informed millions of Americans about the fastest growing group in America. She has reported hundreds of important stories from immigrant work camps in NOLA after Katrina, to teen girl victims of sexual harassment on the job, to Emmy award-winning stories of the poor in Alabama. Inojosa is considered by many to be a Latina living legend, and she is our guest today on Spilling Chai. Hola and bienvenidas to the show, Maria. Hi, Maria. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am good. I am freaking out that I'm speaking with you. Um, thank you <laughs> so much. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Okay. So my first question to you, first of all, thank you again so much. This is probably a huge career highlight for me. <laughs> so America, as you know, has a history and policy of taking children away. And it almost happened to you and your mother. But for so many people, most Americans, they saw this policy for the first time under the Trump administration. How do you feel about the Biden administration's approach to immigration, you know, not increasing the refugee gap, keeping it at historically low levels? Are you disappointed? I'm beyond disappointed. I'm having a a particularly rough time, you know, given where we are in the country in this moment. And then to continuously hear the Biden administration making these policy decisions and policy statements. Jen Psaki, his spokesperson, said yet again, you know, don't come. This is not a time to come. And then said something like, we've got to make it as difficult for you to get here as possible. And I'm like, well, yeah, basically the same thing that the Trump administration was saying. So this for me has been, I did not have high expectations. And To be clear, what Trump was doing, which was at every turn increasing, you know, he was turning the wrench at every turn. Donald Trump was turning the wrench. And so I've been quite radical in my response. I'm like, if you're going to continue to allow for this kind of radical dehumanization of people who are refugees in their majority, then I'm going to become radical like you. And so I'm going to say to the president, You should be going down there and kissing the children who are arriving here. You should be hugging the women and telling them that they will be safe here. And for those people who happen to want to get away from whatever, because it's dangerous or because they want a better job or because they have a dream, he should also be saying, and you know what? We're going to welcome you too, because we understand that you're a part of our American economic recovery. Yeah. And so- yeah, go ahead. We'll, we'll, you know, if you have whatever, I mean, there's a way to do this. That is not what it is now. And it's really reframing the entire argument. You know, I'm really committed to painting a picture of Central American countries that are actually fully functioning. I'm not saying that they are not corrupt. I'm not saying that they aren't violent, but I'm also saying that not everyone in the countries wants to come here. Yes. This country is not all that and a bag of chips, you know? So not everybody wants to come here. And I want to make it clear, the people who are coming here is because they are desperate refugees. In that case, then you have an appropriate policy reaction if you call yourself a president who has human feelings. Yeah. These are refugees. 
So I'm I'm quite devastatingly disappointed. Oh, I, I hear you. Why do you think Biden is doing this though? Why why do you think he's? I mean, I think maybe I was a little bit naive. I expected him to do exactly what you just said he should be doing. Why do you think he's responding so similar to Trump? Well, the short answer is going to sound a little bit disrespectful. It's because he's not a leader. Wow. Honestly. Yeah. Because a leader would understand. A leader would sit back and be just like, hmm. Let me see. The fastest growing demographic groups in the United States of America are Latinos and Asian Americans. Uh Uh-huh. They happen to be on the front lines and being like the most attacked groups, maybe because the past president was so attacking of them. And so I understand party politics and I understand that actually the future of the Democratic Party is in their hands. And so I'm actually going to be really strategic about this. And I'm going to say, you know, make a big statement, say the Democratic Party under my watch changes and it will forever be the party of immigrants. And I'm going to show you how I'm going to show you because I'm going to legalize not in eight years. What is this? Excuse me, bullshit of legalizing people in eight years when they've been waiting already 20 or 30. Are you kidding me? Oh, my goodness. So I feel like he doesn't have good counsel. And if you read my book, Once I Was You, you understand that this is what happens. Okay. So first let's just, so it's historical context. First, original sin was slavery, but the first sin was genocide. So you have anti-Indigenous sentiment, anti-Latino sentiment, anti-Asian sentiment, anti-immigrant sentiment. It is all connected. And so what he needs to do is to completely flip the narrative. Yes. And own it for, I mean, he would cut the Republicans off at their knees and he would guarantee his party's incumbency for quite a ways to come. Yeah. Clearly, he does not have the courage. So you were recently on an episode of PBS's Finding Your Roots. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. (laughs) It was crazy, huh? What was it like for you finding out you were related to the founder of Monterey? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what was it like finding yeah. this piece of your story? Oh my gosh. You know, I tell my students, cause I have 16 different jobs and I'm Mexican, right? One of them is I'm a professor and I tell my students never give up on your dreams because you just never know. And I, of course, like many people had always dreamed like, God, I would love to have a finding your roots to have them do all the work. <laughs> you know? Well, they did. And you know, when you get that email, you're like, is this real? Like, are they real? And it's like, yeah, it is real. And it was an interview, like there will be no other interview in my life like this one because it was about a five or six hour interview. Wow. It was epic in the middle of a pandemic. So I actually didn't get a chance to hang out with Skip or with anybody. I was in a roof off to the side with the makeup person who's a friend of mine. And then I would sit down for these, you know, I don't know. I mean, I still haven't let it all sink in. I, I'm i still having to process it. I'm getting the book. You know, they they now are sending me that book that I was looking at that has all of the information. I'm getting it in the mail and I'm processing, you know, one of the things that Skip asked me that didn't make it into the show was, you know, what do you feel like you've learned now from your ancestral roots? And I'm like, well, that I had a, you know, that conqueror part of my family was the adventurer, was the risk taker, was the mission oriented, was the unstoppable dreamer. And so I'm going to take that, you know, I see that mostly reflected in my father, who had this crazy dream of wanting to help to create the cochlear implant before it even had a name. And that's what he did. And so I feel like that ancestral root of pushing forward is part of my father's lineage. And then, you know, the matrilineal, the beauty of it was, you know, there is no doubt that I am indigenous. So there's a calling that I'm feeling to really go deep and research that part so that I'm clear about the conquerors, because there's a lot of history written about them, but that I'm able to find some rootedness through my matrilineal line of indigenous women. So I'm, you know, I I just got a text WhatsApp from my cousin who's like, oh my God, prima, (laughs) you know, the other primos want to talk about it. They want to see it, but they can't. They're in Mexico. How to send us the link? Can we have a Zoom? You know, so I was telling my son, I was like, I'm about to have a Zoom with 
all of my cousins that I grew up with in Mexico who are scattered all over. And we're going to have a Zoom because of finding your roots. I'm overjoyed. And it, to me, it's like just the beginning. You know, I just want to find the time yeah. to actually go to these places and do more research on my own. It is too cool. I mean, I've never been envious of someone's story more. <laughs> um, so speaking of Mexico, most people don't know that the U.S., actually has quite a bit to learn from Mexico, especially when it comes to women's ensuring women's access to political office. Mexican women hold 48% of seats in the Chamber of Deputies, 49% in the Senate. In the global rankings of women's representation in Congress, Mexico is first in Latin America, fourth in the world, ahead of countries like Sweden, Finland, and Denmark, which are famous for you know being super feminist about political access. What do you think the U.S. can learn from Mexico? Mm. Well, actually, I think of my country now, of Mexico, as one of the most democratically engaged countries that I know of. Wow. I mean, people taking to the streets, people protesting at all times, people demanding from their government. And so this makes me very excited because, you know, when I was a little girl, Mexico was pretty anti-democratic. Nobody voted People didn't partake. It was a. Uh, it was essentially an authoritarian, faux democracy, uh, labeled a democracy. Mm-hmm. But for seventy years, the same party was in place. Wow. So that's like the hopeful side is the Mexican engagement, Mexican community engagement, mutual aid, local organizing, local demands, um, incorporating art into everything. There's so much that this country. I mean political organizing, union organizing, labor rights, you know, a particular kind of feminism that is about, you know, not just give us a nine to five and treat us like men. It's a deeper conversation. And sadly, I think what what this country did learn from Mexico was instead how to manipulate the media. You know, they took cues, the Trump administration probably took cues from that authoritarian Mexican government that used propaganda and gaslighting for years And now Mexico is learning from the United States, the worst of the United States, the absolute worst. Mexico is becoming an anti-immigrant, immigrant immigrant policing, detaining and deporting country. And it horrifies me that this is my Mexico, that then it is what it's becoming. Yeah. Oh, gosh. You are such a trailblazer and you created your own newsroom, the Futuro Group. So people of color got to say and what gets reported, what stories, who tells the stories, and what stories are told. How do you feel today when you see the creation of diverse newsrooms like the 19th, led by women of color? Are you hopeful about American journalism maybe getting better about telling the stories of Black and Brown Americans? I mean, if you think about the media landscape that we have now versus, let's say, 10 years ago, I mean, Futuro is now 11 years old. It is really exciting. I mean, 10 years ago, in terms of kind of like independent, I mean, there was ProPublica that's existed up until now, not a lot. And they were run by white men. And so the fact that now we have places like Futuro, like the 19th, there are a few others. I'm not going to remember the names because of COVID brain, but certainly we have, you know, Instagram is much more present. And so you have a different kind of a conversation, you know? So these are the moments when I feel really hopeful, right? When I'm just like, and I think of my students and I think of my staff and I think of the opportunities that we have to hire young journalists and employ them. You know, that's what I'm able to do now, which is like thrilling, absolutely thrilling to be able to help them be on their career path as journalists of color and of conscience, And you don't have to be of color to be a journalist of conscience. But I also, I mean, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it, but, you know, I do ponder, you know, what is Rupert Murdoch's end game? Yes. What exactly is your end game, bro? Uh, Honestly, Fox News is such poison in our world. And I, I know journalists who work at Fox News, so not everybody who works there but the we, we do know what they allow in the prime time in the commentary. We do know these characters who are outwardly, you know, white supremacists like Tucker Carlson, who I know. 
Yes. Yes. I've been on his show. But Maria, I want to ask you, why is his show the number one rated in the country? Do we have bigger things to worry about than Murdoch? Is he catering to what Americans want? It is the number one show in the country. What does that tell us? Well, I'm I'm always intrigued by Nielsen ratings or whoever is doing the ratings Interesting. and who they're measuring and who they consider to be a valuable viewer who has the boxes. Yes. Oh, I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm just wondering. What a great point. I'm yes. I'm just, I'm just wondering. Yes. I, and I guess also, you know, to answer your question, I guess people want to see a clown. <laughs> people want to see a clown. I mean, they do. I mean, he's really clownish and impish. I mean, I worked with Tucker at CNN. So I'm just like, bro, oh, you wow. were like, you were such a, like a, a wannabe, a nobody, you know, you, you lost the show that you had crossed fire <laughs> and you tried to find your footing. You know, he, he, it's only because he's a, a, a white man of extraordinary mediocrity that he's able to have this amount of the door opening to success. But there are so many mediocre white men. <laughs> Can I tell you, that is actually the quote I want tattooed on my forehead. I always remind myself, may you have the confidence of a mediocre white man, right? In America? Is that one of the best yeah. things to be? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the thing is, is that his days are numbered in the sense of, in the scheme of things, this country is getting browner. It is becoming more Asian. It is the black community is becoming, not becoming, has always been, but now has more and more and more platforms to own the power and the narrative as should be. Should be. So our country, you know, and it, this would have been, this could have been a very different conversation if Donald Trump had won. He didn't because people voted. So democracy won. Having said that, you know, they're going to put up a fight. Yeah. So the all of the voter suppression, this is for real. And so everybody has to have a plan for how you're going to vote. Yes. Oh, amen. Okay, last question. You are in so many ways a living legend for Latina women, for women of color. I love your fighter spirit. And I love seeing your boxing videos on Twitter. They make me work out. <laughs> I'm like, I've got to go do something. Just look at Maria and Rosa. Um, what, <laughs> it's true. Uh, what is your advice to young women of color who struggle with stepping into their power? What, what do you want to say to them? Oh, wow. I mean, I understand. So I, I want to, first of all, say I understand. I get it. Of yeah. course, you who are legitimately feeling attacked, haunted, disempowered, dehumanized, those are all very real things. Yes. And and you can name them. I mean, I couldn't name it. I didn't have a name for any of this stuff. You know, it was just like, oh man, this stuff is happening. And and you just, you know, would would literally power through. Mm -hmm. But I talked so much about kind of getting to your core and finding the thing that really moves you. That and some of this, I know it's hard because there's a lot of, you know, mass information that's coming at you, you know, it's a lot of incoming. But I think of, for example, Harriet Tubman yes. and how she would have these moments where, you know, she had a, she suffered a traumatic brain injury because they cracked her skull open, but that would send her into these kind of to have these vision. hypnotic trances, right? These, these visions. Yeah. So I would hope that we would connect to that visionary in us, that person who has a sense of what we want to do. And, and it may be for me, it was journalism. For other people, it may be acting. For other people, it may be music. It may be a museum curation. It may be zoology. It may be astronomy. I mean, uh, who knows? Neuros. I have an amazing young woman writer who's uh, going to be an OBGYN, Latina, you know, Peruvian, whose mother was taken away from her by ICE and then returned later. But she's going to be, you know, so it's not all in one place, but that you need to be in it for the long haul. Yeah. And you need to speak to yourself. And so you need to do things that ground you. Yes. And it's, uh, and it's, you know, I'm still, I still have to ground, you know, I still have to go and do my grounding and do, you know, so it's not like you get to a place and you're like, oh, boy, OK, I've arrived. I've All right. I got it. I figured it all out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Oh, no. That is no, so true. No. That is so true. I'm so glad you said that, because that's something I just realized. 
I always felt like I was going to get somewhere or it's a destination, you know, this feeling, but it's not, it's constant, right? You have to reassure yourself and believe in yourself. Keep pushing yourself forward. (laughs) But yeah, I mean, that's, that's all we have. And we have to push ourselves forward and get inspired. Like right now, the women who are inspiring me are women who are over 60, 70, et cetera, who are total badasses and who are just like unstoppable. And I'm like, okay, cool. All right. All right. Okay. You know, Um, I got this. (laughs) (laughs) Fantastic. Maria, thank you so much. And I will, I will speak with you soon. Thank you, Anusha. I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a good one. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Maria. You too. Ciao. What I love the most about Maria Hinojosa's life and work is how it serves as an inspiration, a reminder that making room for yourself as a woman of color is a fight. If you had any doubt about the truth of that statement, just look at the current controversy surrounding the 1619 Project architect Nicole Hannah-Jones being denied tenure at UNC. Maria had some words of encouragement for her friend and colleague Hannah-Jones, to whom she tweeted, I'm standing with my colleague and friend and inspiration, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Black women, Latinas, immigrant women, women of color journalists, always questioned, never trusted. But Ida B. Wells and Jovita Idar teach us never to back down from la truth. At UNC, we are watching you. If you enjoyed this episode of Spilling Chai, don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app, We are also streaming on YouTube, so make sure to check us out there. And of course, don't forget to follow us on social, on Twitter and Instagram at Spilling Chai Podcast. And until next time, let's keep spilling the chai.